If you've been playing games for a while, chances are at least once you've thought about what your dream game would be. A satisfying blend of your favorite genres and themes mixed with your own creative elements and devoid of any aspects you dislike from other games. Kenshi, which means swordsman, started out this way in the mind of a solo developer, and after a lengthy, more than decade-long development process, which included being one of the original Steam Early Access titles and eventually changing from one-man developer to a small team, it finally got its 1.0 release in 2018. Just describing Kenshi makes it sound kind of like a pipe dream. A post-apocalyptic, samurai-themed, sci-fi, open-world, sandbox survival RPG with RTS and city-building elements. Needless to say, a project like this required a lot of ambition, which is all the more impressive considering that it was mostly developed by one person, and the fact that he actually pulled it off and created one of the more truly unique RPGs out there. Kenshi has a massive open world with distinct biomes and creative cultures, plenty of threats lurking around to encounter, complete freedom to set your own goals and craft your own stories, deep RPG mechanics which allow for plenty of customization and can make you feel like you really earned your progression and the ability to chop off all your limbs and become a cyborg. It still bears plenty of scars from its humble beginnings, but despite being rough around the edges, for me and many others, its positive aspects outweigh the negatives, and it has a big modding community that's helped add improvements and patch up some of its shortcomings. Kenshi has 13 different game starts, which affect factors like starting location, skills, equipment, squad size, and other circumstances that affect early game difficulty. But one, in particular, The Wanderer, is considered the default because in its description it says, this is the way the game is intended to be played. This was the first and the last time that the game specifically told me what I should do. There were motivations that pulled me in certain directions, and I had to operate within the game's systems, but other than the basic need to survive, Kenshi wants you to think up quests and goals yourself, since no one in the game will assign them to you. It's a refreshing departure from the stricter narrative structures in many other RPGs, and this kind of creative freedom was one of the most immersive features in the game for me, as I tried to think up fun and interesting ways to fit my squad somewhere in Kenshi's world. Even when the novelty of this started to wear off and I shifted more towards just grinding for a while, it still stuck in the back of my head as something I could slip back into whenever a cool idea struck me. Planning out adventures or raids, deciding where to try and live or who to ally with, or just trying to escape the chaos and chill out on a beach somewhere, and then having to think on your feet and react when something doesn't go your way, or if you make some new discovery that alters the course you're on. But before I actually got to doing any of that, I had to go through the what the hell is going on phase. I got stuck in character creation for a while trying to decide who to play as because some of the different races look so cool, their descriptions are pretty interesting too and their experience multipliers to consider. And I did some of this. But this wasn't totally necessary because I soon learned that there are tons of opportunities to recruit new members to your squads. And it's made clear early on that there's no special significance to the character you create. At least not as far as Kenshi's world is concerned. Maybe Kenshi's single most defining feature is just how little its world seems to care about you, especially at the beginning. You're just some random person in some random town with no information about the world around you. I actually found this very motivating, and it made me want to immediately start exploring and leave some kind of mark on the world. Whether it's something like that or some other motivation, everyone leaves this first town eventually, and most Kenshi players have a similar experience here. Wander around for a bit, run into a group of hungry bandits, get beaten within an inch of your life, and crawl or limp away ashamed of how pathetic you are. It's a kind of welcome to Kenshi initiation that gives you a nice little introduction to just how cruel its world can be. This happened to me, but a second welcome to Kenshi moment happened a short while later. I had a very small squad at first, so even early on their hunger levels were easy to manage but I still wasn't thrilled about having to spend a chunk of the money I earned mining copper on food when I could be saving it for some nice armor or weapons. So when I spotted a small pack of goats wandering by, I was delighted that I just scored a free meal. <laughs> Except apparently the goats here are cold-blooded killers. They had no problem wiping the floor with us. Then we had to do a limping walk of shame past these escaped servants who I'm sure were laughing at us. But the joke's actually on them, because losing fights like this is a good way to train toughness, which increases after taking damage or getting up to fight instead of playing dead after getting knocked out. So losing fights can be a good thing. It took me a minute to wrap my head around that. It's not often where you'll spend time in a game actively trying to lose fights and then be glad about it. But I got a pretty rude awakening when I tried doing this in some other zones and found out the enemies there would eat my squad members or enslave them. I guess the goats were pretty nice after all. 
Having a squad member die or get enslaved sucks, but it seems like something the game wants you to experience because of just how easy it is to encounter, especially for a new or unexperienced player. Nothing scales in Kenshi, so if you venture into the wrong zone with a weak squad, you could be in big trouble. Slavery is all too common in Kenshi's world, and it's hard to avoid falling into its clutches eventually. But overcoming these setbacks by escaping slavery or recruiting new squad members to replace whoever died feels empowering because now you've experienced Kenshi's worst, and you've come out on the other side of it. Just kidding, it gets worse. Leveling most other combat skills by just throwing my squad into fights was effective a lot of the time, but starting my own little boot camp sometimes had even greater benefits. Walking around encumbered to raise strength, sparring with captured enemies, and using training dummies for the early levels all helped my squad become more powerful. This wasn't really an enjoyable part of the game because there were other things I'd rather have my squad out there doing, but some of these training methods were just way too effective to ignore. After watching my squad constantly get pummeled by bandits in the beginning and putting them through a strict training regimen, the tides finally started to turn and I actually started winning some fights. Even though this was only against the most basic of enemies at first, it still felt rewarding because of everything my squad had to endure just to make it to this point. It's no doubt rough starting out in Kenshi, but once you make it to the mid or late game stages, the hard earned progression from lowly weakling to fierce warrior does provide an undeniable sense of satisfaction. The experience multipliers for different races are noticeable, but they never go below 20%, so the amount of extra work you have to put in isn't quite bad enough to take away the freedom of being able to put anyone into any role. Lots of different armor pieces with various skill multipliers and several different weapon types with their own distinct strengths and weaknesses are also there to give you a solid amount of customization options. There are late game armors that outclass the rest in some situations, and for a while I was just equipping whatever I could find or afford, but the real fun for me came when I stopped worrying about getting the strongest armor possible and just started equipping whatever was at least decent but also looked cool. Some of it's pretty stylish. So it's not just the freedom of setting your own objectives that allows for extensive roleplaying. How you decide to construct your squad also has a major impact on your experience. In Vanilla Kenshi, you can recruit up to 30 characters, which would play much differently than controlling just a single character. But both are viable options as long as you're willing to adjust your playstyle accordingly. A solo run could benefit from training stealth and assassination skills instead of always just charging at enemies. And a big squad of hungry mouths to feed means you'll need a reliable food operation like farming, hunting, or making money to pay for it. During combat, a single slot attack system makes it so that your melee fighters attack one at a time. If you surround an enemy, your squad will take turns attacking instead of everybody swinging together. And during a big brawl, they'll break off into their own little skirmishes and won't just swarm specific enemies. The enemies you face treat you the same way. Large battles can still feel chaotic, and area of effect damage is still there, but this does make the fights a bit more slow and methodical. Having the greater numbers does help, but this still discourages you from just recruiting a big, untrained squad and using them to easily overrun stronger enemies. Kenshi's world can be unforgiving and filled with cruelty, but it's almost like everyone in it decided to put that aside for a moment and sign a pact to fight somewhat fairly. Maybe not the most believable thing, but these duels do highlight the combat animations, which in some cases look pretty awesome. The biggest negative I noticed here was that chasing down an enemy that's running away just looks silly, but I was able to appreciate the cinematic style of these samurai-like duels most of the time and using big weapons to mow down multiple enemies with AoE damage was always satisfying. If you feel differently, you could use a mod or use crossbows, which apparently don't have the single slot restriction. You can't talk about Kenshi's combat without mentioning limb damage. Attacks target specific body parts and arms turn into jelly when they are severely damaged, which looks highly amusing and can prevent the ability to use weapons, heal an ally, or pick them up. Badly damaged legs causes limping or crawling, which can be a real hindrance to someone trying to quickly escape an area and make it to safety. When the damage to limbs is even more severe, they'll fall off entirely, or fly off. And if this happens to one of your squad members, you get to replace them with robotic prosthetics, which if you get decent ones are an improvement over the puny flesh they had previously, since they can withstand a lot more punishment. It's a cool feature that ties in well with the whole suffer to get stronger theme. One of your squad members got literally hacked to pieces, but now they're a badass cyborg. Throw on a samurai helmet and they become Kenshi's version of Darth Vader. I spent a pretty significant chunk of time after starting Kenshi just in and around the opening area of the border zone. Despite its barren desert appearance, I was pleasantly surprised at how much I found to do around here. 
I joined a faction of thieves, visited a nearby city and village, which introduced me to Shek and Hiver culture. I recruited my first couple of squad members, mined copper for days, and of course got into countless fights with bandits. I did purchase a small shack in the starting town, but I had no intentions of settling down here. Even though there are no objectives forcing you to explore, I doubt hardly any first time players can resist the urge to find out what's out there in the rest of the world. The map is way too big and too mysterious to ignore. Once my squad could handle most threats in this region without much difficulty, it was time to move on. I was partially inspired by the nomads, peaceful wanderers who trek around the world with their animal companions. I wanted to be sort of like them, minus the peaceful part, so I let them sell me one of their pack bulls. Its massive inventory was immediately useful for storing loot and important items. He's basically a walking storage chest. What I didn't realize until later though was that eventually he'd become one of my best fighters. Once he got older and stronger, he could unleash devastating attacks that could one-shot even powerful enemies. Combine this with his high health and inability to become crippled, and he was an absolute force to be reckoned with. The only downside was that occasionally he would photobomb my view while I was watching my squad in combat. But thanks to the huge amount of camera control you have, I could at least try to avoid this. And being able to zoom in and out and rotate the camera to my heart's desire had a huge impact on what it was like exploring Kenshi's world. I'm sure you've noticed some of this already from the footage so far, but I should mention it too because it's a fantastic feature that I don't want to take for granted. In many other open world games, you have to wait until you come to a cliff or some other vantage point to have a really good spot to take in the scope of your surroundings and survey the terrain. But in Kenshi, you can do this at any time, because it lets you zoom out so far and move the camera around a bit with the directional keys. It's incredibly useful for things like scouting for enemies, buildings, or paths, or being able to send your squad off in different directions while still keeping everyone in view, and surveying an entire battlefield if a fight starts to spread out. One of the downsides of exploring was having to wait for the game to load in new areas, which was especially irritating when I was trying to quickly cover a lot of ground. Sometimes it's pretty seamless, but when it's not, these loading sequences can be very jarring because it's a little unpredictable what'll happen. The game might pause for a few seconds or things keep running, but you get hit with harsh stuttering or a bunch of graphical glitches until it finishes. Sure, this can look hilarious the first few times it happens, but it does get old after a while. I almost would have preferred to just have loading screens here. Thankfully, it usually only lasts a few seconds, and since it only happens while moving to a different location, if you're staying in one area, you can go a while without seeing it. But overall, it was definitely something that got on my nerves. There are other glitches and bugs too that can happen pretty often, but these were rarely game-breaking or had a major negative impact on my playthrough. Definitely the most hilarious one was how sometimes when you put down a character someone is carrying, they'll magically turn into rubber and bounce way up in the air. Kenshi was never going to win any awards for its graphics, but it does have a unique visual design throughout many of its zones so that its strange alien world was initially an alluring place to travel through. The variety and sharp visual contrast between some of its zones helped to make discovering these new areas instantly exciting. Walking straight from a desert into a rainforest is weird, but also engaging because you're immediately aware of how drastically different this place is than where you just came from. You'll need to prepare for different enemies, new factions, and maybe different weather effects like acid rain, dust storms, or even giant laser beams, which can negatively affect skills or straight up damage health if you don't have the right gear to deal with it. There's real tension that comes along with the intrigue if it's your first time exploring a zone. Venturing into a new area with a lower level squad is a little like playing Russian roulette. If dangerous enemies are waiting there to murder you, then you better hope your athletic skill is high enough to get you out of there. It's stressful, but it's also part of the fun. Being deep in some strange new area, beaten half to death, surrounded by harsh weather and enemies crawling around, gives you a real sense of accomplishment if you can actually survive and make it out of there, or find a settlement where the guards will protect you. Sound-wise, most of what you hear while you explore is just ambient noise. Music does fade in and out, but only for short periods, and it never seemed tied to a specific event in-game. This made me kind of cherish the moments when it did play, especially if it started to chime in at just the right moment while I was cresting a hill or running towards a distant sunset. Most of the tracks are slow, melancholy, and have a mysterious, alien kind of quality, and I thought they worked well to enhance the strange, uncaring vibe of Kenshi's world. When it comes to the enemies you encounter, there is some variety, but a few of them felt overused, like bandits and beak things, who seem to pop up all over the place. In total, there aren't many different species of monsters or passive creatures, but I do like the design for some of what's out there. 
like these friendly swamp turtles and the swamp and river raptors. It's a post-apocalyptic setting, so I guess it makes sense for it to not be absolutely crawling with diverse life. It's the factions who do the most to make Kenshi's world feel alive, and they range from small groups of ninjas or farmers to major kingdoms and nations who control large sections of the map. Of the game's five major factions, I kept up decent relations with four of them. In the simplest terms, the Shek Kingdom looks the coolest, the Western Hive is the most unique, the United Cities is the biggest, and the Tech Hunters are the most knowledgeable. But it was the Holy Nation and their evil ways that demanded my attention more than the others. These religious zealots are known for their racism, misogyny, and reliance on slavery. They hate robots and will immediately attack if you have a skeleton in your squad. Look at this guy, how can you hate him? You can delve into some lore which explains their views in more detail, but long story short, they're easy to dislike. After several clashes, my relations with them deteriorated to the point that, even after my bounty wore off, they would still attack me on sight. You do have the option to pacify factions that you've angered, for a hefty price, but why bother when I knew that I'd fight with them again eventually? Holy Nation territory sits right in the middle of the map, and running into them at some point is pretty much inevitable. But some of the smaller factions are tucked away pretty well and require a good deal of poking around before you locate them. And as you might expect from isolated recluses, what you find here can be really bizarre and sometimes terrifying. There are multiple kinds of satisfying discoveries you can make in Kenshi's world, like ancient ruins containing important items, boss-like enemies you can turn in to collect a bounty, or unique instances of environmental storytelling. But stumbling on one of these obscure, weird little communities out there in the wild was probably my favorite thing to uncover. They might have a strange or sadistic philosophy, which they'll present to you in a way that doesn't usually rely on much dialogue, unless shrieking counts. Conversations aren't non-existent in Kenshi, but they are brief and spread out pretty thinly across the world. A potential new recruit might give you a little bit of backstory, and your squad members chime in with comments from time to time. The majority of people you run into are silent though, which does add a kind of blandness to chunks of Kenshi's population. And this is made worse by the fact that a lot of the NPCs and settlements like to just hang around, and don't really do anything at all unless they're attacked. They will sometimes fight with each other, but not on a grand scale, unless you initiate this yourself by killing or imprisoning a faction leader, and then a new faction might swoop in and take over a settlement. Many of the short exchanges that I did encounter had at least a touch of humor in them, so that did help put some personality back into the world. And there are some characters that are a bit more talkative, like Beep, a hiver with big aspirations who likes to beep a lot, and will throw more kinds of quirky humor your way if you let him join you. Add in his sympathetic backstory and his amusing appearance, especially if you give him some fancy sunglasses, and it's not hard to see why he's considered the most endearing and iconic character in the game. Robotic skeletons are also great to have along for a number of reasons. They're immune to weather, don't need to eat, have strong bodies, and heal quickly. But maybe their best feature is that they'll occasionally fill you in on some of Kenshi's cryptic history. These conversations, the lore books you find, and all other lore-related dialogue is pretty rare though, and sometimes hidden away really well. But the scarcity of this information made discovering it feel special and meaningful, like I was unearthing ancient forgotten secrets. The environment is also where a lot of your clues about Kenshi's past come from, and the mystique and spectacle of some of these discoveries can be pretty awe-inspiring the first time you see them. Some of the time they ended up raising more questions than answers though. Eventually I went to the wiki to try and fill in the gaps of anything I might have missed, and while there certainly is intriguing lore to uncover, some things do still stay shrouded in mystery, so to an extent you're left to your own devices to try and theorize parts of what happened here, which actually seems pretty fitting considering the open-ended nature of the game as a whole. After I spent a significant amount of time exploring and grinding, I did eventually reach a point where traveling around the world lost a lot of its appeal. A lot of the regular enemies became too weak to provide enough experience for my now stronger squad, and since the map is huge, going anywhere takes time. You can speed things up, but there's no fast travel, and trekking long distances filled with mostly pointless encounters and sights I had already seen did start to feel boring. There were still a couple of zones that I hadn't visited yet, and places that still offered challenging combat, but sometimes I'd have to venture halfway across the map just to get there, and I didn't always feel like making the trip. There was no real thrill left in making money either, since once I had trained up stealth and thievery a bit, it got pretty easy to just steal valuable items and sell them. Kenshi did have something else up its sleeve to keep me hooked though. Base building. 
Waiting as long as I did before building a base made this aspect of the game much easier. I'd already bought a few houses in various cities and used them to research important upgrades for my future base. I also had a decent stock of rare books and items that I found hidden around the world, and I could use these to research some of the more advanced stuff too. This definitely helped me jumpstart the building process, but it's not a requirement to do it this way. You can start a base at any time. Trying to hold down and protect a base with a lower level squad and less defensive upgrades would be more difficult and demanding, but watching it slowly progress from a small settlement into a large fortress and your squad get stronger from defending it seems like it could be a rewarding experience if you manage to succeed. Too much of a challenge can spell your doom though, which is what happened to my first base, despite how prepared I was. That's because where you decide to build has a big impact on how successful you'll be. Initially, I wanted my base on Holy Nation territory. We hated each other and what better way to stick it to them than to settle down right on their land. But I must have started building right in the path of where Holy Nation soldiers like to patrol because they were absolutely relentless with their attacks, and I couldn't even get my walls built since they kept showing up. I could handle a few waves of them, but eventually it became too much and I had to pack up and move on. I relocated to Shem a desert oasis scarcely populated by only small packs of beak things and the occasional group of bandits, and my buddies the nomads. I figured that if this is where they like to stop and get some rest, then it must be a pretty peaceful area. And I was right. Things were much calmer here, and before too long I had a functional base up and running. My squad had a farm and a kitchen so they could make their own food, crafting stations to make their own equipment, access to plenty of resources, a training facility for new recruits, and what kind of base would be complete without its own torture chamber. Kenshi's automated job system lets you assign tasks to your squad so that you can sit back and watch them go to work without having to micromanage everything. Stacking a bunch of jobs on one person, in the right order, and then watching them produce something useful from scratch without having to lift a finger myself was undoubtedly gratifying, especially when I thought back to earlier in the game when I'd have to pay or work harder for this stuff. There were occasional bandit and ninja raids and animal attacks where enemies would try to bust through the front gate, but these were relatively infrequent and easy enough to handle even with just a couple of guys manning the defensive guns. Out here in Shem, we didn't have to worry about paying taxes or dealing with Holy Nation shenanigans, like Prayer Day, which we would have if we had settled in some other zones. This kind of laid-back atmosphere was really nice, for a while, but eventually I started feeling a little restless, and I found myself actually kind of missing the chaos and struggle of trying to build in a more volatile region. Next time, I might start a base earlier, or maybe I'll build a second base somewhere a little more eventful. In case you haven't figured it out by now, there's no real end state in Kenshi. Even if your entire squad dies, the rest of the world keeps going. I'm sure you'd stop playing then, but my point is the game lacks a predetermined winning scenario. You have to decide that for yourself. If you have ambitious goals like killing all the major faction leaders and you're determined to see this through, it can definitely be a major time sink. And if you don't aspire for something like that and feel content enough to call it quits, you can still get something out of a new playthrough where you use a different game start and try to do things differently. Yes, Kenshi has rough graphics, too many glitches, and its tough early stages puts it low on the accessibility scale, but if you can get past its shortcomings and overcome or embrace the early game hurdles, it's definitely a game that I think's worth getting into, and I don't know of anything else quite like it. The playthrough I did for this video was my first real one, so I played mostly vanilla and used only a couple of small mods. But next time around, there are definitely a lot more that I'd like to try out. They're right there in the Steam Workshop, so they're no hassle at all to install. And last but not least, in case you're unaware, there is a Kinshi 2 in the works. It's a little difficult for me to fathom what a more polished, higher budget, and possibly expanded version of Kinshi would even be like. But I know that whenever it gets released, However far off that may be, I'll definitely make sure to find out.